numerous reports indicate that manufacturing is emerged as the favorite target of ransomware groups and hackers. In response, a new report from Industrial Media discusses the evolution of industrial cybersecurity, its current state, and the tactics hackers are using, including phishing schemes, malware, and ransomware attacks. It also details solutions in Army manufacturers with the knowledge and resources needed to win more fights on this highly complex and ultra-competitive battlefield. Download the industrial sector's new battlefield by going to manufacturing.net backslash cyber. Hi, I'm Jeff Ranke, Editorial Director of Manufacturing.net and Manufacturing Business Technology. Welcome to Security Breach. According to IBM's Cost of a Data Breach report, nearly 20% of the organizations surveyed stated that they have experienced a breach stemming from a compromise in their supply chain or a vulnerability related to it. The average cost of these breaches was estimated at just under $4.5 million, or about hundred grand more than the overall average for a cyber attack. Their data also found that attacks emanating from the supply chain had a longer life cycle than average. Organizations took an average of 303 days to identify and contain a supply chain compromise, which is 26 days longer than the overall average. The increased costs and complexities of addressing supply chain attacks is not a surprise, especially when you consider that these intrusions not only impact the targeted company, but the logistics, distribution, and retail elements that are dragged along on this difficult and painful ride. In some instances, the fact that the targeted company runs on the smaller side, say less than $100 million in annual revenues, creates added pressures on these enterprises, as they may not have the resources or cybersecurity plans in place to respond to such an attack in a timely manner. This often leads to paying ransoms or failing to fully kick the bad actors out of their system, setting the stage for future attacks. Here to dive into the factors associated with supply chain attacks and other cybersecurity challenges is Theo Zephyrakis, a cyber risk and information security expert at Fortra, a provider of AI-powered threat mitigation solutions. Well, I'm going to start you off with kind of a first pitch fastball. We'll jump right into some, some key topics here. And the big one I was hoping we could talk about today is supply chain attacks. I know this is an area that, that you've spent a lot of time on. It's something that's getting a lot of prominence right now, a lot of coverage because of the sort of trickle-down impact that it has on so many players within the industrial sector. So maybe you can just give us an overview a little bit. What are some of the big things that you're seeing impacting these supply chain attacks from either a vulnerability or, or just sort of an enterprise soft spot perspective? Yeah, that's a great question. And the most common types of supply chain attacks cover most of the times one of three areas. We're talking about either affecting software that's uh, utilized uh, by the different uh, sectors, the devices that are used to access the software, or even the people themselves that are using that software. So I could elaborate further on those uh, three areas, especially when we're talking about software being the predominant uh, one. Uh, a lot of organizations rely on software to run their business and uh, cyber criminals know that. Uh, they could either breach code at the source, uh, they could affect code repositories and they could exploit vulnerabilities not to affect only the supplier, uh, but also every user of that software. Right, so they could have a trickle down effect. Uh, malware could be uh, hidden, it could be di di distributed, and it could have a wide uh, spread impact. And we're talking about software. One of the most common software people are familiar with is, for example, the Swift banking network. Right, so that is a solution that is used by the financial sector uh, for financial transactions. Okay. We look at software there and, and the industrial side, we're looking at ERP, we've got supply chain management, we've got inventory management, all of these different platforms kind of at work. Is there one in particular that has proven to be more attractive to the hackers that they go after? Or is it just kind of logging in wherever they can and, and doing what they do? It's where there's an opportunity. A lot of times also we're going to look at software. They may have weak security controls to begin with, especially uh, software that may be used to control OT devices, HVAC systems, uh, CCTV cameras, uh, and any software that is widely used by many organizations because then the potential for harm is greater. All right? If it's a popular software used by a lot of individuals, a lot of organizations, uh, cyber criminals could leverage that to have a widespread effect. Absolutely. And I think the other two that you mentioned there are also really definitely worth diving into a little bit. Devices is interesting. It's interesting that we're still dealing with 
devices because you would think this would be something that is a point of, of really concentration and focus for the industrial sector, making sure we're not bringing in foreign devices from home or, or BYOD or anything like that, as well as when we're hooking up new technology and making sure everything is secure. But what are you seeing there that's still causing some challenges or creating some challenges uh, on the device side? Well, it's the wide range of devices that we have, we have uh, come uh, accustomed to using and connecting to our network, uh, not just laptops, phones, uh, tablets, but USB keys. We have cameras, uh, power, utility, as I mentioned earlier, HVAC systems, more, more and more, uh, we have more systems connected uh, on the network. In other situations, I've even seen vending machines that are connected to the network just to keep track of the inventory uh, and equipment being distributed to the workforce. Uh, so that is the challenge. And a lot of those devices were not built uh, with cybersecurity uh, or the hackers in mind. So they may be uh, vulnerable and difficult to repair and patch. Uh, so that allows uh, points of entries for those cyber criminals to uh, gain access to corporate networks. Yeah, and the last one you brought up people, I mean, that's, that's so interesting because it just feels like personnel, they can be the biggest solution and also the biggest challenge when it comes to cybersecurity in terms of keeping folks out and putting those, those plans, keeping the plans working that maybe have been developed. What's been your experience there in terms of, do we need to update the training? Do we need to get people more involved and understand things from a bigger picture perspective? Yeah, and the latest trend is uh, communicating to people and getting them to be part of our defense mechanism, uh, creating that cybersecurity culture. It's not just about awareness anymore. Uh, we have to get them to understand that they have a role to play. Uh, they have the power to contribute to protect uh, the network. Uh, and it's not just up to IT uh, to protect them. Right. A lot of times we say that the people are the weakest link. Well, we'd like to say it's the most neglected link because until now we have focused on technologies, firewalls, IPS, IDSs, and we have neglected the individuals, right? especially when it comes to the supply chain uh, compromises. Uh, business email compromise is an attack that happens through the supply chain, right? If you're used to dealing with an individual, well, what if that individual gets compromised, it gets hacked? Now, they're sending you email while well, you're receiving this message. Well, it's coming from someone that I know. I should automatically trust it and follow the instructions, even though it's asking me to change uh, the bank account information, right? And send an uh, immediate payment to a late invoice. Now, we have to take the time to train employees to even recognize those attacks that appear to be coming from people that we know and we trust. You know, usually I wait a little bit into the interview to, 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 uh, to talk about the company, but I think that kind of um, leads in very well to some of the things that Fortra does in terms of using AI to identify threats. Maybe you could talk a little bit about that now, because I would think with the rise in phishing schemes and the role AI is playing there, as you just mentioned, some of the things you guys are working on are, are targeted at that very thing, if I understand correctly. Yes, well, uh, industrial cybersecurity uh, it's, it's, it is unique uh, because the attack surfaces uh, is not just uh, operations technology, but also information technology. And how do we bring those things together? Uh, Fortra has been uh, providing solutions for uh, OT in, uh, OT in uh, a very long time. And AI is a factor that doesn't only help the attackers, but also helps us on the defensive side. Right. Uh, the improvement of technologies will allow for safer IT OT integration. You know, that's the biggest concern. How do we get those two to talk to each other without, uh, uh, you know, making each other stop from working? Right. The OT systems tend to be a lot more sensitive to disruption and so on. Uh, the solutions also that we offer help organizations uh, simplify compliance, especially if you have a regulatory compliance for a specific sector, especially uh, in the energy sector that uh, and manufacturing sector that you have to comply with certain regulations, protection of personal information. And what most organi organizations are concerned with is remaining operational and uh, pr productive, right? Uh, so we need to do that. We need to increase awareness of individuals and making sure that uh, vulnerabilities are properly managed. Absolutely. You know, you brought it up and I can always tell how, what people's personal experiences have been when I ask this question just by their nonverbals. But one of the big challenges, and we talk about this a lot, is that dynamic between IT and OT personnel. And you alluded to trying to get them to work together. What's been your experience in terms of how those two factions are, are working together? How far have we come? Or, or what are some of the bigger obstacles that you've seen there? 
Well, awareness of uh, each other's requirements and risks is the biggest challenge. Uh, what we've seen in the past is that you have to train the OT personnel on cybersecurity, which in my opinion may be easier on training cybersecurity personnel on OT risks, uh, but it depends on the individuals, but you have to train them and you have to understand. And for cybersecurity, it applies not just to OT, but for every business unit that you are tasked to support. You have to understand what their concerns, what the capabilities are, what their capacities are, and, and, and so on in order to provide proper support. OT personnel on the other side are mostly trained to provide systems that remain operational and available. But availability is a task of cybersecurity, right? The cyber criminal hits your, your system, it's no longer operational, it's no longer available. Were you, uh, did you implement the proper controls to defend against a human attacker, right? Because cyber, cyber crime, uh, cyber breaches happen because the adversary is a human, not just a system anymore or a software that went down. Yeah, very interesting. Yeah, I can tell by your response. I think we're, we're gaining some ground there. We're getting better because I didn't see any eye rolling or wringing of hands mm -hmm. or anything else. We've had some other guests definitely tell some horror stories in terms of trying to get those two to work together. So it looks like we're gaining some ground at least. Circling back a little bit, Theo, to some of the supply chain stuff, we've had some pretty high profile supply chain attacks in the last year, even just in the industrial sector. Are there any of these that kind of stand out to you as being maybe a turning point or one that really woke people up to the fact that this is a big deal, this is attacking um, a lot of different industries, a lot of different enterprises of different sizes, things of that nature? Well, the recent example uh, affecting the auto dealers across North America, I think is going to be an example used uh, by many uh, because this is an example of how one supplier breach could have impact of millions or even up to billion dollars of operating costs in the sector. Uh, I'm not sure you're familiar with the cyber attack targeting the uh, CDK Global, a company that provides uh, software to handle financial transactions for uh, car dealers in North America. Uh, well, the data, uh, the data breach lasted about two weeks, which made uh, over 15,000 car dealers not to able to do financial transactions. And this only stopped because there's a belief that the affected organization probably paid the ransom uh, that was holding their, their, their systems hostages. And it's believed that there was a ransom paid of almost $25 million. Whoa. Uh, so, and if that ransom was paid, well, that money is going to be used by these cyber criminals to power and enable a lot more tax on a lot of other sectors. The impact though was not only to that organization, it was uh, to all the car dealer companies that were using that software. So we're talking about a loss of up to a billion dollars uh, that may have uh, occurred as reported by various uh, news media. So that's one example, but there's a lot more that probably don't make it to the news that uh, in some cases we uh, I'm familiar with is uh, manufacturing organizations that we're working with uh, that kept having repeated ransomware attacks. And these kept coming in through their suppliers. Their suppliers had, you know, they had thousands and thousands of suppliers that had access to their systems, access to their network, uh, and they kept introducing ransomware into their network. They, obviously, they had a, a zero to uh, tolerance for ransomware. They never paid the ransomware. Uh, they always tried to recover the systems uh, as best, as fast as they could. Uh, but uh, we helped them improve their, their phishing detection process, their response capabilities, you know, it takes one person to click to fall a victim, but at the same time, it takes one person to detect and alert someone to prevent the harm from, from spreading. And also they introduced a new and reinforced awareness program, not only to their employees, but also to those suppliers, right? If those suppliers were small companies, they did not have a formal uh, security program. Well, that organization extended its own security and awareness program to those suppliers in order to protect its own systems and networks. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. You bring up a couple of different points there, and I'm going to present these like they're black and white issues. They're not. They're more complicated than that. But what advice do you give folks when it comes to being ransomed? I mean, it's easy to sit here and basically say, well, don't pay it. We don't want to pay it. We don't want to fund terrorists. We don't want to fund criminals. But when things are down, especially on a plant floor, that's a tough decision to make. Where mm -hmm. do you stand when it comes to paying the ransom? 
Well, if you're prepared and you have no choice, uh, you may have no choice, but start by being prepared. Uh, the first step, because after that, you have no excuse if you didn't take whatever precautions you could uh, to prevent from having paying the ransom. And even if you pay the ransom, it doesn't mean that you will be able to recover as quickly as you think. Uh, I've seen examples where the ransom was paid and it still took two or three weeks to recover the systems uh, because the decryption was so slow. Right. Uh, so it's always a, a last resort. You know, I cannot advise on whether you should pay or should not pay. Best advice is be prepared to recover and only pay if you are left with no other choice or if not paying will result to a bankruptcy or a closure of your organization. Yeah. You know, the other part of that, too, that comes into a lot of these attacks. Again, I'm oversimplifying, but it seems like they could have had could have been um, maybe averted if there were better segmentation strategies in place. There have been a number of cases where people did enter through software programs, they were dropping malware, and it just wormed its way through the entire system. And it seems like if there was more segmentation, maybe the attack wouldn't have been as big. It could have been contained more quickly. What's your take there? I mean, segmentation is definitely an important part of cyber defense, but is it underutilized in a lot of cases? Yeah. yeah, segmentation, I would say, is one of the simplest uh, from uh, forms of controls that could be put in place. Other organizations talk about zero trust architecture, which tends to be a lot more complex set to implement. But at a minimum, segmenting your user networks versus your IT networks versus your OT networks is uh, the minimum organizations should be doing. And segmenting you know, also means having the proper controls at the perimeter, right? And if if those uh, segments could still talk to each other freely, well, you know, you don't have proper segmentation. So having proper segmentation where the traffic is strictly controlled between two segments is the minimum. And this is what we see a lot of organizations in that sector are, are doing to start with. You know, is is uh, doing that segmentation and also having uh, backups that are protected from ransomware. A lot of backup solutions are now providing security against uh, the ransom from propagating into the backup of your systems to the backup of your data. So at a minimum, you could recover from those. No, that makes a ton of sense. The third thing that kind of jumped out to me there is you're talking about some of these systems being down for two or three weeks car dealers aren't able to properly track inventory. We actually had a local cyber attack here where it was a, a car parts um, business where basically they were writing stuff down on you know scratch pad and paper, just trying to keep track of things there. There's a lot of regulatory efforts in place. There are definitely laws in place here in the US for those what they call critical industries, the critical infrastructure, infrastructure where they have to report this information, they have to be very transparent. There's also things with the SEC where a company mm -hmm. has to report elements of a cyber attack in terms of how it impacted their business. Mm -hmm. But it's focused on companies of a certain size, of a certain nature. It's not as uniform maybe as it, it will be down the line. What's your take there? Do you think we need sort of this government action to force people to be more transparent about these attacks so we can share information and I would think get better as a community in terms of fending them off. I, I totally agree with you because that's what the cyber criminals are doing. They're sharing information on their side. We have to do the same thing. A lot of organizations are already doing it. They may have a sector or industry groups uh, to share information, but we have to include also the small players in the organization. In, in the sectors, because those small players may be suppliers to bigger organizations, right? Uh, so if they're affected, the the impact is cascading to uh, to the next level and the next level that is using that supplier. So we can't ignore and we can't exclude small organizations just because they're small. They may be critical in the supply chain. Absolutely. Yeah, I think we're on the same page there. And I think one of the issues that some of these smaller companies also deal with is they don't think they're a big target, or even if it's not, sometimes it's not even size. Sometimes it's just the nature of the business because they don't feel it's a critical component. It's a, it's an essential industry, whatever you might, whatever term you want to use there. They just don't go out and get the resources or they don't have the ability to develop them internally from a cybersecurity perspective. And I think where we're seeing this the most is in developing OT cybersecurity specialists, individuals who really understand the OT environment and understand how to secure it. What have you seen there? What are your thoughts maybe on trying to develop this workforce? Is it is it doing things to develop people internally? Is it gotta be a more global effort in pushing younger people into this type of career path or, or what would be your take there? 
Yeah, it's important to get individuals to follow that path, uh, but also it's very important uh, for the suppliers of those technologies to start developing systems that are secure from the beginning, and maybe even uh, themselves contributing to creating those programs uh, for training those OT uh, specialists. Because we have to uh, understand that OT systems will vary significantly from one industry to the other. It's not just a Windows server, which is the same in any organization, right? So we need those large organizations those suppliers, those producers of those technologies uh, to step up and play a critical role into preparing the organizations and uh, the future workforce. No, I think that's a great point, getting people to work together, because as you said, the hackers are working together. How specialized they've become in terms of, you know, I'll, I'll worry about breaking into the system and getting you the credentials and passing that along to somebody else who specializes in developing the ransomware and whatever the case may be. Like you said, they've got a community that's working together and, and we need to counter that with similar tactics. Um, building off of that a little bit, Theo, what do you feel are maybe some of the things we're learning? We've seen a lot more of these high profile supply chain attacks. They're getting in the papers. People are becoming aware when they can't get their favorite you know, cereal or detergent off the, the store shelves. What do you think we're learning here? Has there been some big takeaways that maybe over the last couple of years we've learned from and we're getting better at? Well, like you said, the main lesson is that there are real world implications of cyber attacks right, in, on the supply chain. So it will be uh, physically felt by many uh, individuals, organizations, customers, and so on. Uh, this, in, when there's a breach in the supply chain, uh, the effects are, could be a lot more far reaching than we initially thought. And also the effects tend to be uh, compounded, cascading, and they may uh, implicate many organizations, but also business functions right within the same organization. Uh, operational disruptions, you know, a stalling of production lines uh, leading to significant delays in uh, manufacturing or delivery schedules or affecting essential services as a healthcare, utilities, power, transportation, all those will be felt by the end user who is relying on those uh, resources, right? Uh, as we saw in the previous example that, that I talked about earlier, the economic impact also cannot be ignored. When you have to pay so much money either for a ransom or to recover your own systems, right, it will impact the bottom line. So the financial losses that we incur uh, either from a ransomware or recovery from a breach system, rebuilding system, buying new systems, uh, could affect even the market value of an organization with causing its stock to plummet and investor trust to, to, to erode. Absolutely. And those are great points when trying to demonstrate the ROI. That's such a big part of investment in the industrial sector. Showing that return on investment, well, <laughs> it's pretty straightforward when you can demonstrate to those in the C-suite what this could cost us in the event of attack, not only from just an operational perspective, but as you alluded to, a reputational risk, stock prices, all of those things. Um, what and when that, you sorry. Uh, sorry. No, go ahead. And when you come up and down to your operational and manufacturing uh, downtime, right? It's easy to prove the ROI. You know, if the factories stop working, if our services stop uh, delivering, well, what is the cost per hour, per day, per week, right? And you, you could easily map it to that and have a clear ROI. Absolutely. You know, when I think about the supply chain attacks too, Theo, one of the areas that kind of stands out to me is the fact that you would think a lot of state-sponsored hackers or some of these folks who try to sort of hide their nefarious activities as a hacktivist and say they're, you know, they're still politically motivated and having a far-reaching effect. What are you seeing there in terms of the impact of these types of hackers, um, maybe the resources or the, t the ways that they go about hitting, you know, their victims and sort of the longer term impacts they can have. Well, the availability of hacking tools and AI enabled tools had made it had ma has made uh, targeting uh, the supply chain much easier for even the casual hacker. So we're facing that challenge as well. Uh, either state sponsored or cyber crime or organized crime will target uh, a specific organization or the supply chain and will not stop until the breakthrough. Right. Uh, so there's uh, those two different areas that we have to deal with uh, and prepare for. Uh, you know, it's not just being a state sponsored anymore, because like I mentioned, the availability of tools and the ease of, you know, scanning uh, systems, scanning networks, finding the vulnerability, taking the opportunity to compromise that person or that entity that did not take the time to, to install the latest patch. 
I'll take advantage of it, right? As a hacker, uh, you know, uh, you know, shoot first and figure out uh, later if they're worth it or not. No, absolutely. Uh, Theo, are there any other big trends that you're seeing right now? I mean, we've touched on AI. We've talked about some of the workforce shortages and some of the other things that are going on. When you look at cybersecurity right now, specific to the industrial sector, are there any big trends that are kind of catching your eye right now? Well, the most uh, one I would say is uh, developing instant response plans. Uh, you know, we often say in the, in the cybersecurity that it's not a matter of if you get breached, it's when you get breached, right? So being prepared, uh, having a disaster recovery response plan that you could pull out in case of a disaster, business continuity in case your operations get affected. Uh, so at a minimum, have that in place uh, and testing them on a regular basis basis to ensure the effectiveness. Because protecting all your systems, all your endpoints, all your entry points will take a lot more time, right? If you have your incident response plans, uh, will help you uh, no matter when the breach happens. It will help you contain the breach, communicate the breach, uh, no matter what is affected. Business continuity management, now it starts working a lot more with cybersecurity and disaster recovery planning uh, to ensure that, you know, if something happens on the cybersecurity side, can we pull out our disaster recovery plans as a response to recover much quicker? Uh, you know, we, we have to do a proper communications uh, to internal staff, external stakeholders, uh, start recovering processes either manually, like you said, pen and paper. Are we ready to do that? Right. Uh, so we have to be able to re to respond to cybersecurity with the same uh, business continuity plans. You know, you've mentioned planning a couple different times. It makes all the sense in the world. One of the issues that we hear about a lot in sort of the gaps that develop in these plans is from what is probably the very first step, which is sort of doing that asset inventory and understanding where everything is, understanding all the connection points, all the API calls can even come into play there. Are you seeing the industrial sector or just your clients overall getting better at just understanding and, the vis and having visibility? on their operations or is that still uh, a, a huge challenge for a lot of folks? Uh, it's getting better uh, understanding their own internal crown jewels and the yeah. most important systems and data. Uh, but the next step is ex uh, start to include your supply chain partners, your suppliers, your service providers, and ensuring that they have that same robustness in their plans as you do. Right. Uh, so that yeah. becomes about, I would say, the, the next step. And that I can only imagine the types of conversations and challenges that presents as well. I'm sure there's a lot of people in our audience going, yeah, we know we need to do that. That's a tough conversation to have sometimes. And to even to start. Yeah. So wrapping things up here a little bit, Theo, you're, you're very heavily involved in all these things. You understand the threat actors. You work for a company that is focused on threat mitigation and detection. What helps you sleep at night? I mean, there's gotta be a lot of things that could potentially keep you awake in turn when you think about all the threats that are out there. But what sort of, you know, gives you that peace that when you put your head down at night, things will be all right? Well, I, from the cybersecurity side, I see a lot of uh, organizations and a lot of startups uh, focusing on IT and OT uh, security. So that helps me to see that it's still a point of interest uh, from a commercial perspective, uh, because there's a lot to be done in that area. Uh, so knowing that we will never stop trying right? Uh, it helps me uh, sleep at night. Uh, the fact that we're having these type of conversations, right? That also brings the topic uh, top of mind for many organizations, many individuals, uh, and security leaders have to start having those conversations internally and raising this concern within the uh, cybersecurity committee they may have, executive management, just to, uh, to raise the concern a bit higher uh, within the organization and the board. Excellent. Well, Theo, this conversation has been fantastic. We covered a lot of different stuff, put out a lot of good information on supply chains and just IT and OT with cybersecurity um, concerns overall. Anything else you'd like to touch on? Anything else we may have, uh, have missed? So uh, uh, we have to start with the uh, basic principles and the basic preventative measures, you know, doing proper risk management, implementing policies, network segmentation, user awareness training. Uh, by doing so, we'll be able to address 80 to 90% of the uh, vulnerabilities and threats that uh, may affect us. Thanks to you. And for more information on the work he and his colleagues are up to, you can check him out at Fortra.com. 
Also, like to thank you for joining us today. To catch up on past episodes, you can go to manufacturing.net, ien.com, or mbtmag.com. You can also check Security Breach out wherever you get your podcasts, including Apple, Amazon, and Overcast. And if you have a cybersecurity story or topic that you'd like to have us explore on Security Breach, you can reach me at jeff at ien.com. For Theo Zafirakis, I'm Jeff Ranke, and this is Security Breach.